so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, construct the metric on um, square root 8 thirds uh, Liouville quantum gravity. And the way that we're going to build it is um, we're going to um, we're going to construct uh, a variant uh, of the Eden model um, in the continuum. using um, SLE6, so SLE6 on uh, square root 8 thirds uh, Liouville quantum gravity. OK, so before I do that, let me just uh, quickly review the discrete story. And try to motivate why you should guess that um, any of this is going to work. Um, so let me uh, begin by um, supposing that I have uh, we have a triangulation um, of the plane. So this is the uh, uniform infinite planar triangulation, and um, I'm going to let. Uh, T be the root triangle of the UIPT. Okay. Then um, what you can imagine doing is you can imagine um, performing um, an Eden exploration. Uh, starting from this uh, marked um, triangle. OK, and this is going to be in the dual graph. Kay. So um, how does that work? So you imagine that you have uh, your initial triangle, uh, T. So let's say that's T. Um, and then each stage, what you do is you look at the cluster that you've made. You pick an edge at random on the boundary, and then you just explore the opposing triangle. So maybe the first triangle you see is this one, because you picked this edge. And then maybe in the next stage you pick, let's say, this edge. And then maybe you pick um, this one. And then every once in a while you'll, you might see something like this. So if I pick this edge, I can have a triangle come all the way around and cut off a big, um, a big bubble. Etc. And because uh, I'm starting off with a uniform uh, infinite planar triangulation, uh, the holes that I cut out here, these are going to be um, conditionally independent. Uh, triangulations of the disk. Uh, given their boundary length. Okay, and um, it's also going to be true that the um, the boundary length of the uh, infinite component. This is going to be a Markov chain. This is a um, is a Markov chain, and you can write down what the transition probabilities for this um, Markov chain are. Okay, so this is one um, very natural model, and um, another very natural model that you can do on the UIPT is um, site percolation. So another natural model. is you can do uh, site percolation. And um, 
And so here you start off with a triangle, let's say your root triangle, and I can imagine that I've prescribed some boundary conditions. So maybe this is black, this is black, and this is white. And then I can do uh, a percolation exploration. So let's say starting from here, I reveal this triangle, and maybe I see something that looks like this, in which case I'm going to go this direction, and then I reveal this triangle, etc. And then just like before, sometimes I see triangles that do something um, more complicated. So I can see something that see a triangle that does something like this, uh, etc. And um, the point is that the uh, the holes which are cut out by the percolation exploration, these have um, the same law um, as the holes cut out by the Eden exploration. And not only that, but it's also true that um, the boundary length of the, um, the infinite component this uh, evolves in the same way. So this evolves in the same way as in the Eden model. Okay. And so um, the way that you want to think of this is that somehow uh, percolation and the Eden model, they're exactly the same, except um, the only difference is that when you do a percolation exploration, you just have to keep track of uh, where you're going to explore from next. Okay? So in some sense, the Eden model, this is the same thing as the percolation exploration, except for you, you sort of forget where you're going from at each stage. So the Eden model is the same thing as uh, percolation, except um, At each stage, you forget from where you were growing from, you resample it uniformly at random, and then you uh, reveal another triangle. Okay. Okay, so that's sort of a very simple observation. And it's also uh, very natural to expect that um, the Eden growth. This, um, this um, at large scales, this, um, this looks like um, a metric ball, looks like a metric ball growth. And this was in fact proved um, in a work, relatively recent work of, uh, of Nicola Carrion and, and Jean-Francois Legal. So this was, um, this was proved by, uh, by Carrion and Legal. Okay, so, um, so what are we going to do? Um, so we're going to use this, this intuition, but in the continuum, and what we're going to do is we are going to um, construct the metric for Liouville quantum gravity using the continuum analog of this um, discrete picture. And so the continuum analog of percolation is just going to be um, in SLE6. And um, the planar map is going to be played, the role of that's going to be played by the Liouville quantum gravity surface. So um, we're going to construct this metric by, um, by reshuffling an SLE6 curve. Okay. 
So that's the general idea. Um, so before I jump into the exact construction and the proof of the metric property, um, let me just do a very quick review of some of the things that we talked about uh, last time. So let me remind you of some of the objects. Um, so when we talked about LIGO quantum gravity spheres, we worked on the infinite cylinder, um, which is just the product of the real line and the interval from 0 to 2 pi, with um, the top and bottom of the cylinder glued together. And um, the law of the distribution uh, which describes the Liouville quantum gravity sphere um, is very simple to um, very simple to, uh, to sample from. And how do you do that? So you do it in uh, two steps. So first you, um, you take its projection. So you take the um, projection of H, which is the going to be the random field, onto um, the space of functions um, which are constant on vertical lines um, to be given by uh, 2 over gamma times the log of z where here z is a Bessel excursion of um, dimension 4 minus 8 over gamma squared. And um, once you uh, form this process, you then have to reparameterize time appropriately. And the way that you do that is that you uh, take its quadratic variation to be just given by um, dt, so it has constant speed. So to have a quadratic variation, with constant speed. And um, this describes uh, one part of the distribution. And the other part of it is the, um, what you get when you project onto the orthogonal complement. And the projection onto the orthogonal complement of the space of functions which are constant on vertical lines, which happens to be the space of functions which have zero mean on vertical lines, uh, you just take that to be um, the same as a Gaussian free field, as a Gaussian free field on the cylinder. OK, and that's the, um, that's the construction of the Liouville quantum gravity uh, sphere that we're going to work with. And um, let me just emphasize uh, a couple of points about this construction, which are going to be very important for um, what we're going to do in a moment. Um, and that's that, uh, first of all, the points uh, which lie at plus infinity and minus infinity, these are, are special points. They're marked points. And they turn out to be uh, quantum typical. And what do I mean by that? Um, this just means that, in other words, um, if you pick two new points, so if, um, if we sample x and y from the quantum measure, u sub h, so this is the area measure associated with our, our sphere uh, independently, uh, 
And then we um, perform a change of coordinates, um, which swaps these two points with plus and minus infinity. So then we perform a change of coordinates. Um, which swaps plus infinity and minus infinity with x and y. Uh, then the result is going to have the same law as what we started with. So then the resulting um, field is left invariant. Um, And this is true, um, actually, modulo one small thing. So this is true modulo uh, a horizontal translation um, and a rotation. About um, the line um, from minus infinity um, to plus infinity. Okay. And the reason that this is the case is that, or one way of seeing it, it's not at all obvious from the definition that these points, I mean, they're obviously special from the definition, but it's not obvious why they're special. And the reason that this is the case um, is that the way that we constructed the sphere to begin with was by somehow pinching a bubble off uh, a quantum cone. And the special point in a quantum cone is somehow, you should think of it as a, as a quantum typical point. So really, these are um, these spheres. They're they're doubly marked because they have these two special points at um, plus infinity and minus infinity. Kay. So the way that we like to think of um, this object, which it's a sphere and it's parameterized by the infinite cylinder, and it's described by the distribution H, and it's marked by the points um, plus infinity and minus infinity. This is um, an embedding of um, a doubly marked uh, quantum sphere um, and if we don't want to specify how this is um, uh, the particular choice of parameterization or field, um, sometimes we just write S for the quantum surface and then the two points X and Y that we are marking it with. Okay. Okay, and then the other thing we talked about is um, what happens when gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds and we explore our sphere with an SLE6. So I'm going to let eta be um, uh, a whole plane Uh, SLE six from uh, minus sorry plus infinity to minus infinity. Okay. So the picture is that you have your um, your cylinder. It looks like this. Here is um, sorry. I'm going to make it go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So here's the cylinder. And um, you can then draw your independent SLE6 on top of it. So you have this, this curve. Sometimes it wraps around, etc. And um, so I tried to explain last time that the holes that this uh, SLE6 is cutting out um, These have a very special, uh, very special structure. These are um, quantum disks. And um, moreover, they are 
conditionally independent given their boundary length. So just like in the discrete story when we explored the UIPT with um, percolation. Okay. And moreover, the point which contains um, plus infinity, that's a uh, special. And so if you run your SLE up to a given time, the component containing um, plus infinity, it's not exactly a quantum disk. It's sort of a special quantum disk. And the reason is that it somehow has to contain this uh, extra marked point. And the way that that shifts its law is that it's just going to be a quantum disk, but it's weighted by its area. So it's size biased by its area. Okay, so we have this um, exact description of, um, of what's going on here. Uh, one other thing is that the, the process which describes the boundary length uh, of the component containing plus infinity this is going to evolve as a um, the time reversal of a three-half stable uh, Levy excursion. which has um, upward jumps, so with only upward jumps. So the, okay, so what do I mean by that? So that the Levy excursion itself has only upward jumps, but after you time reverse it, you get something which has um, downward jumps. Okay. And these uh, jumps just correspond to um, the downward jumps of this uh, time reversal. These just correspond to the, um, well, the boundary lengths of the holes uh, that you cut out by the SLE6. Okay. Okay, so that's the general picture. And so what you get is, is, is the following thing. If you take a quantum sphere, when gamma is the square root of 8 thirds, and you explore it with an SLE6, an independent whole plane SLE6, then this produces for you a 3 half stable uh, Levy excursion. plus the collection of quantum disks that correspond to the downward jumps. Okay, so there's some way of going from uh, this picture to this picture. And it's not at all obvious from what I've said so far, but it turns out that you can actually go in the other direction. So it's also possible to go this way. And what this means is that if you just observe this uh, Levy excursion and the quantum disks, as well as how they're ori oriented, then you can measurably recover um, the other picture. So these two things are actually encoding exactly the same amount of, of information. Okay. So, in other words, if you're given either structure, you can um, measurably recover the other. And this last point is something which I didn't say anything about, and unfortunately, due to time, time constraints, um, I won't, have, won't be able to say anything about how one uh, constructs uh, that arrow there. OK, but it turns out that these two objects are just exactly the same. And so what this means is that we have um, sort of two ways of producing quantum spheres. We can either use. Um, 
our levee excursion, or we can use a Bessel excursion. There's actually a third way of producing a quantum sphere, uh, somehow using correlated Brownian motion. There's another excursion measure, um, but also due to time constraints, um, I can't, uh, I'm not able to discuss uh, that, that uh, third construction. Okay, but, um, so let me just mention that we have sort of two natural infinite measures that produce for us quantum spheres. that we've uh, talked about. So method one, this is where we describe uh, the distribution uh, which corresponds to the, the field representation of the sphere. And this is based on a Bessel excursion of dimension four minus eight over gamma squared. And when gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds, this is just an excursion of a one dimensional Bessel process or just Brownian motion reflected at zero. And the second method is you can just use um, a three half stable Levy excursion. Okay. And you know what, what the three half stable Levy excursion is encoding is it's encoding the, the quantum sphere plus the SLE6 on, on top of it. And this uh, third construction which I'm not going to talk about, somehow encodes um, the sphere. And then in addition to that, you have a space filling version of, of SLE6 rather than just SLE6 <coughs> itself. Okay. Great. Okay, so that's um, kind of the um, background, just reviewing what we did before. Now, um, let me give you um, kind of the very high level idea for constructing this metric from these uh, tools that I've just described for you. And I just want to emphasize uh, a few things um, before jumping into the details um, so that there are a few things about it that uh, hopefully you'll appreciate. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build a growth process And this is our uh, QLE uh, 8 thirds 0. And this is going to be um, built out of SLE 6 on a square root 8 thirds uh, Leeville quantum gravity sphere. And this, um, this growth process, what it's going to be is it's going to be our candidate for describing um, metric ball growth. But it's not you know, obvious from a mathematical perspective that this really is describing a metric. And then what we have to do is we have to check that um, the uh, growth processes that we've defined these actually do uh, correspond to um, well, the growth of metric balls for some metric space. Okay. Okay, so that's the um, general strategy. Um, let me make a few more uh, kind of clarifying remarks about what we're going to do um, in just a moment before we actually do it. Um, number one, the metric that we're going to construct in just a moment, this is only going to be um, only defined, um, at least to start off with, on um, a countable dense set of points in our sphere. 
Um, and these points, um, they're actually going to be, um, they're just going to be conditionally independent uh, points. So IID points um, X sub I, which are all going to be chosen from the, um, the measure, so this, the area measure associated with this uh, surface. Okay, and then um, it takes uh, quite a bit of extra work beyond just checking the metric property um, to show that uh, uh, number two, the space that we construct is going to be um, to show that the, the metric uh, continuously extends to a metric on, this uh, on the whole sphere, so to a metric which is defined on the whole Liouville quantum gravity sphere, which is homeomorphic to the Euclidean sphere. And it also requires uh, quite a bit of extra work and another set of ideas to show that this metric space um, is equal to the Brownian map. Okay, so in the construction, um, if you're an expert in the Brownian map, you'll see some of the properties of the Brownian map sort of emerge, but proving that this is actually exactly the same as the Brownian map uh, requires one to understand um, some additional properties which won't be obvious uh, from this construction. And then finally, in the construction, um, we're going to show that this metric space is a measurable function of the um, field used to construct the Liouville quantum gravity surface, but it's not going to be obvious that the Liouville quantum gravity surface is a measurable function of the um, Brownian map structure. So there's also an extra argument to show that the metric space structure by itself um, determines um, the Liouville quantum gravity surface that we started with. Okay, and so these are all sort of uh, separate issues. And what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on this one here, just constructing and making sense of the metric. Um, and then if anybody's interested, I can explain later some of the additional ideas that go into um, establishing these points. Excuse me, Jason. Yeah. Uh, can you recall here, please, um, when you have the SLE6, uh, how do you measure the boundary length? Oh, so the way that the boundary length is defined is that um, you can always apply a conformal transformation, which takes you, um, let me draw a new picture here. So you have your, uh, your SLE6. You can always apply a conformal transformation, um, which takes you from the uh, complement of this disk to, let's say, the upper half plane. And the field that you're going to get when you apply this conformal transformation is going to look like a free boundary Gaussian free field on the boundary. So it has a well-defined notion of boundary length. Um, yeah, so in fact, I mean, what's very important is that the unexplored region is always a quantum disk, a Liouville quantum gravity disk weighted by its area. And these, uh, these types of surfaces always come with an intrinsic boundary length measure. So you can always talk about um, the length of the boundary. That always makes sense. Right, but where it comes from is just the fact that these distributions arise from the free boundary uh, Gaussian free field. And, and so you map the bi-conformal transformation, then uh, you have some multiplicative factor in which also... Yeah, that's right. There's always the correction term. That's right. So whenever you apply a change of coordinates, you always have the correction term. And um, that's just the right correction term so that areas and boundary lengths are preserved in the right way. Right. Um, that's right. Okay, um, right, so let me, right, uh, okay, so before I do the metric construction, I have to emphasize um, one other point, 
uh, which is very important to keep in mind when one um, works with these objects, and that's that there are, at this point, sort of two natural, um, well, let me just say two parameterizations, which makes sense to talk about um, for uh, the SLE6 on um, the square root 8 thirds uh, Liouville quantum gravity sphere. So you have um, your SLE6, it's going from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, like this. And one kind of very important question is what is the right uh, time parameterization to talk about uh, for this SLE6? And there are um, there's sort of two of them that make sense. So you can talk about number one, the capacity parameterization. Um, as seen from plus infinity. That's one possibility. And um, the other one, which is going to be the one which we actually care about, is the, um, the time parameterization, which is associated with, with um, the, the three-half stable Levy excursion. Okay, and the reason that this is sort of the, the one which is sort of natural to think about, the second one, is that this is just the, um, this is just the one which corresponds to um, the continuum analog of um, of what you would do uh, if you were exploring a percolation exploration in the discrete one triangle at a time. So it's the continuum analog of the parameterization um, which corresponds to uh, revealing uh, one triangle at a time. Okay, so when, when we talk about parameterizations for SLE6, we're not using the capacity parameterization that came from Schramm's um, original introduction of it. We're rather talking about the time parameterization which comes from the boundary length process. And the reason is that this is sort of the natural one to think about if you want to think of this somehow as being percolation in the continuum on, on Liouville quantum gravity. Okay, and in a moment there's going to be a third time parameterization, and that will be the one that we actually use to describe the metric. Okay. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to construct the metric. And in the construction, it's very important to keep in mind um, the basic properties that one has um, for SLE6 on Liouville quantum gravity because the metric is going to have essentially the same, well, the right analogs of these properties. So, um, so how do you do that? So I'm going to fix a positive parameter delta that I will eventually send to zero. And I'm going to define my, um, my approximations in the following way. Okay, so here's the uh, picture you should have in mind. So we have our, our sphere, which is described by the strip. And our process, I'm going to define um, my QLE process, which is going to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the way you should think about this is this is like a metric ball growth, where I'm only going to keep track of the component containing plus infinity, and the process itself is growing from minus infinity. Okay, and so what do we do? So we are going to, um, 
Number one, we're going to draw uh, delta units of Levy process time. Sorry, let me say it this way. Delta units of SLE6 with Levy process time, so the intrinsic notion of time, Uh, starting from minus infinity. And so I'm going to get um, my chunk of SLE6. Okay. And, um, right, and then what do I know? I know that the unexplored region is going to be a quantum disk weighted by area. And then I also know that the tip of my SLE6 this point turns out to be uh, uniformly at random on the boundary of this component containing um, plus infinity. Okay. So what I can do is I can then um, resample the tip, so the location of the tip from the boundary measure. And then I can repeat. Just keep repeating this process. So in the next stage, I might, um, after resampling the tip, it might go to, say, this point here. And then I'm going to draw a bit more SLE6 from here. So maybe it does something like that. And then I will, and then the tip of this SLE6 is say at this point, and then I'm going to resample it from the boundary measure. Maybe I get something here, and then I draw more SLE6 again, like this. Here's its tip, and then you resample the tip, uh, etc. Okay, and the point is that this is just like first passage percolation. Uh, the only difference is that rather than revealing the surface one triangle at a time, I'm revealing it um, by these chunks of um, percolation exploration. Okay, so this is um, this is um, this is just like the Eden model. This is an Eden model growth. Uh, at least in spirit, um, except um, my chunks that I'm adding, these are um, these are somehow um, pieces of SLE six rather than um, you know somehow corresponding to a single triangle. And the point is that we don't know how to draw single triangles at a time in the continuum, but we can do these uh, SLE6 explorations. And the reason that you would expect this to sort of work is that somehow it shouldn't matter what types of chunks you're adding at each stage. Uh, still, the final answer should uh, approximate um, the metric ball um, growth. OK. Now, the reason for doing this construction in this particular way is that these approximations have uh, a number of very special properties. Um, and this is why kind of the whole thing works. And that's that we know that, number one, the holes which are cut out by the exploration and um, the law of the, um, the uh, unbounded component including its boundary length, these things have um, they're, they're the same as what you get when you do SLE6. So they have the same law as in um, an SLE6 exploration 
of a Liouville quantum gravity surface. Okay, so we know kind of exactly what's going on, at least in terms of the holes, the boundary length process, and the unbounded component of this process, uh, regardless of how we chose, um, chose delta. And so how are we going to define uh, QLE? Well, at least initially, our candidate for metric ball growth is just going to be um, what you get when you take a subsequential limit as uh, delta goes to 0 of this um, construction. Okay, and so what's happening when delta goes to zero is that you're just picking, um, you're just re-randomizing your tip more and more, uh, more and more frequently. And because of how it was constructed, these two properties are also going to hold for the limit as delta goes to zero. So we're going to know that the boundary length, at least at the moment, evolves as a three-half stable Levy excursion up to time reversal. We also know that the holes are going to be quantum disks and the unbounded component is going to be a quantum disk weighted by area. So properties one and two, these are going to hold for the subsequential limit. Okay. All right. Um, OK, and then let me also say that there are also some things that you could be worried about here. So number one, we took a subsequential limit and not a true limit. And you could ask whether or not the metric that we're going to define is going to depend on the choice of subsequential limit. It turns out that it's not going to. And sort of after the fact, much later, it's possible to show that this really is a true limit. And then the second thing you could worry about is that the construction involved additional randomness beyond the Liouville quantum gravity surface. So we had our SLE6s we were drawing, and we also had these uh, points that we were resampling on the boundary of our, our growth. And you could worry that somehow this extra randomness is going to persist in the limit and not give you something which is measurable with respect to the Gaussian free field. But this also turns out not to be the case, um, and that will all come from the proof. So it really is a well defined metric that is measurable with respect to the Gaussian free field and does not depend on the choice of subsequence. And as I said, sort of after the fact, it's possible to show that this really is a true limit and not a subsequential limit. OK. Right. Um, OK, so the notion of time that comes with this limit, the sort of a priori notion of time, is the wrong one, because it's the one that comes from the SLE6. Um, so this comes from the Levy excursion. And um, this is the, the wrong time parameterization for the, the metric. So this is um, not correct, not the correct uh, time parameterization. For the metric. If time equals distance to the root. Sorry, in the, in the metric, time equals distance to the root, right? Um, that's right. That's, that's right. It's going to be. That's right. Um, so the notion of time that our growth process is, is currently equipped with is the one that you would get if you were doing um, the following thing. So let's say this is your root triangle, and your UIPT. And let's say you did the Eden model, where in each unit of time you revealed one triangle. So that was one unit of time. Then the next unit of time you did this. Maybe in the next unit of time you did that, uh, etc. So that's sort of the wrong um, notion of time, because when the boundary length of your cluster is getting longer and longer, you should be revealing more and more triangles, because in each unit of time you're supposed to be revealing one, um, you know, distance one. So all of the triangles which are adjacent to your cluster. And so you have to make a time change. Um, so again, in the Eden model, 
with the correct time parameterization, um, you add triangles to your cluster. at a rate which is proportional to the boundary length. Okay. And um, so we want to make the corresponding time change now for our, our cumuli. And so if, um, if x sub t is equal to the um, boundary of the complementary component, which is containing um, plus infinity when we're doing our QLE growth, then from the construction I've given so far, uh, this, is, um, this is just given by the Three half stable Levy excursion up to time reversal. Um, what we want to do is we want to make a time change so that we are, in fact, growing at a rate which is proportional to its boundary length. So we're going to change time by, um, we want our time to be, um, let's say, S of u, which is the first time uh, t that the integral of uh, 0 to t of 1 over xs ds is bigger than u. Okay, so that's the time parameterization which says that we're now growing uh, at a rate which is proportional to um, boundary length. So that's the natural thing to do. And um, Right. Um, and so what happens when you do that? Your um, so before the time change, x sub t was a three half stable um, Levy excursion. And after the time change, so x sub s of u, um, for people who know about these things, it doesn't actually matter what the definition is, but this is going to be um, a continuous state uh, branching process. With um, branching mechanism U to the u to the three halves, up to time reversal. Okay, so somehow when you perform this time reversal, your boundary length process goes from being a Levy process to being a um, a CSPP. Okay, and so particular, the distance from minus infinity to plus infinity, in terms of Levy process time. It's just going to be equal to um, the integral from 0 up to, um, let me say, xc of 1 over xs ds, where xc is the first time uh, t that xt is equal to 0, the first positive time that it's equal to 0. OK. All right. So. Um, now I think I'll, maybe we'll just take a short break and then in the second half we'll come back and prove that um, this, this defines uh, a metric space. Okay, so maybe I'll start again. Um, okay, so I just defined um, the metric ball growth that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, how are we actually going to extend this? So we're going to assume that we have uh, points xi, and these are going to be iid from um, the quantum measure, so from the area measure on your sphere. And um, what we're going to then do is given 
um, xi and h, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sample conditionally independent uh, QLEs uh, from each xi. Okay, so from each of the xi. And um, actually, from each xi to each um, each xj. And um, then what we're going to do is we're going to set uh, the distance between xi and xj. This is just going to be the amount of time Um, it takes the QLE from XI to absorb um, XJ. Okay, and now I've defined um, this function, which is uh, sitting on top of the Liouville quantum gravity surface marked by these points. Um, but as I said before, um, there's in principle a lot of r extra randomness here because I have, um, well, in the definition of QLE itself, there's a lot of extra randomness. And beyond that, I have sampled a bunch of conditionally independent QLEs given um, my uh, Gaussian free field and my collection of marked points. So that's something to, um, something to keep in mind. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to show that uh, that this D is a metric on the um, on the points x i, and so to do this, there are three things to check. Well, actually, two things. We're going to show that uh, D is symmetric. Okay, so this is something which is not at all obvious if you think about it, because let's say in the picture where I have minus infinity and plus infinity, what I've done is I've sampled two conditionally independent QLEs, one which is going in this direction, and I've defined the distance from here to here to be the amount of time it takes this guy to make it to infinity, and the distance in the reverse direction is defined with a conditionally independent QLE going in the other way. And you know, from the way that things are defined, it's not so obvious actually that um, this is going to be something which is uh, symmetric. And then number two, um, we need to show that it satisfies uh, the triangle inequality. And actually, the proof of part two is going to somehow come from one. And the proof of one will also imply uh, three, which is that the metric uh, D this is determined by, um, by H and the locations of the XI and does not depend on the subsequence. Okay, so it's not going to matter uh, which subsequential limit we chose, um, and that will come from actually just the proof of one. Okay, so really the heart of the whole argument is going to be this um, proof of symmetry. Because once we have that, um, that will sort of, um, that will sort of give everything. Okay. Excuse me, uh, why would they all be conditionally independent? I've just chosen them to be. Right, but uh, what's the motivation? Because um, that's the most natural way to couple things together when you don't understand their joint law at all. If, you, if you're going to put them in the same space and you don't understand how they're supposed to be related, just take them to be conditionally independent. It's also crucial for the proof, too. Uh, it's very important. OK. Um, right, so now I'm going to explain the argument for symmetry. Um, and so how does that work? So I'm going to imagine that I have, in general, 
my quantum sphere, SS, SXY. And it's marked by the points uh, X and Y, which are quantum typical. OK, and I'm just going to focus on the QLE which goes from X to Y and the one which goes from Y to X. So gamma, this is going to be um, the QLE which goes from X to Y. And gamma bar, this is going to be equal to the QLE which goes from um, Y to X. Okay. And here, just to emphasize it again, Gamma and gamma bar, these are going to be conditionally independent. Um, given the underlying surface. Okay. Okay. And what we want to show is we want to show that the amount of time it takes this QLE to go from x to y is the same amount of time it takes its time reversal, not its time reversal, it takes gamma bar, the other QLE, to go from y to x. OK, and so how is that going to work? I'm going to define um, a law theta. And this is the law of um, s, x, y, gamma, gamma bar, and some additional randomness u, where here um, u is going to be uniform between 0 and 1, uh, independent of everything else. OK. So that's what, um, that's what we're going to do. And um, The way that we're going to show that these two distances are the same is that we are going to um, we're going to define um, two new measures. So I'm going to define d theta. So theta x to y is going to be the measure whose radonicotine derivative with respect to theta is going to be the distance from x to y. And I'm going to define my other measure, d theta from y to x. This is going to be the measure whose radonicotine derivative is dyx. Okay? And because we don't know symmetry yet, it's not clear that um, these two measures are the same. And what's our goal going to be? Our goal is going to be to show that theta of x, y, x to y is equal to um, theta from y to x. And once we show that, then this has to be equal to that um, by the uniqueness of radon nicotine derivatives. Okay, so this is what we want to do, because this then um, implies that uh, the distance from x to y is equal to the distance from y to x. Okay, And as you're going to see, this is going to somehow boil down to um, the reversibility of, of whole plane SLE6. OK, and I should mention that um, parts of this argument are actually um, based on uh, another work, which is due to um, uh, so this is based on, um, or related to, um, a strategy developed in another work um, by, um, by uh, Scott together with um, Sam Watson and Hao Wu where they construct uh, a metric on, on CLE4, somehow using um, an argument which is, is, is related to what I'm going to, going to show, you, uh, show you now. OK.
OK, so this is what we want to do. And um, there are sort of two steps to proving this um, symmetry statement. Here's the first one. So I'm going to let, I'm going to define a, a stopping time tau. And tau is going to be uh, uniform between the distance of x and y. So it's just u times the distance from x, the amount of time it takes for the q lead to go from x to y. And I'm going to let tau bar be the first time t that gamma bar of t intersects gamma tau. Okay, so I, I, here what I'm doing is I'm drawing one of the QLEs up until a typical time between its distance from x to y, and I'm going to draw the other one until it hits it. And similarly, I'm going to let sigma bar be u times um, the time it takes to go from y to x, and I'm going to let sigma be the first time t that um, gamma of t intersect gamma bar of sigma bar is not equal to the empty set. OK? And um, what is the first step? The first step is to show that, and this is really the heart of the argument, it's to show that the theta x to y law of um, s comma x comma y um, gamma up to time tau and gamma bar up until it hits it this is equal to um, the theta y to x law of the same thing except for it's uh, gamma up to time sigma where remember sigma is the first time that gamma uh, hits gamma bar up to time sigma bar. Okay, So we're first going to check that and then the other part which um, And then there's a second uh, second step, which um, one also has to check, and that's that um, you need to show that the theta um, x to y law of gamma and gamma bar, um, given everything that we've seen so far, so s x y gamma up to time tau and gamma bar up to time tau bar. This is equal to the um, theta y to x law of gamma and gamma bar given um, everything but with sigmas in places of taus. So sxy gamma up to time sigma and gamma bar up to time sigma bar. OK, because we check those two things, then um, the two laws have to be the same, and therefore the Radonikodim derivative is the same, and therefore the distance measured from the left is equal to the distance measured from the right. OK. Right. OK, so OK, so due to time constraints, I'm just going to focus on the first step because the second step is actually um, very believable if you think about it because this is just something about the sort of Markovian nature of this construction. Um, you know, because we took everything conditionally independently, these are all sort of stopping times. It's natural to believe that these conditional laws should behave uh, well. And it's sort of a, a technical exercise to check that this is all the case. So somehow all of the meat is in the, the first step of the, um, the argument. And so, as I said before, 
the way that this is going to go is we're going to reduce uh, step one somehow to the reversibility of um, whole plane SLE6. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. And um, now let me um, remind you that we have three, well, I've described two, I've described one so far, but there are sort of three natural measures that we're going to consider on quantum spheres. on uh, square root 8 thirds Liouville quantum gravity spheres. And somehow by understanding these measures, this uh, symmetry statement is just going to pop out. Um, so the first one is the one which is induced by um, the one which is induced by n, where n is the excursion measure for um, a three-half stable Levy excursion. Okay, so if, if you have a, a three-half stable Levy excursion, then you can produce a quantum sphere with an SLE6 just by uh, associating with each jump um, uh, a conditionally dependent quantum disk. So there's this measure. The no next natural one is um, you can take the one which is um, the one which is induced by taking um, the measure n, and then what you do is you um, you add to it uh, another variable t. Okay, so there's a second variable here, small t, where here uh, dt is Lebesgue measure. And um, t is equal to the length of the Levy excursion, capital T. Okay, so this second measure, all that I'm doing is I'm taking my Levy excursion and I am biasing it by um, its length and then picking a typical time um, um, between zero and the length of the excursion. Okay. So in this, um, this uh, second construction, the, the marginal of the Levy excursion, so of x, this is just given by um, um, is given by um, just taking um, n and weighting it by its length. Okay, so it's just a size bias Levy excursion. Right. Okay, and then the third possibility The third measure is the one which is um, the one which is induced by uh, one the measure one over x t times the indicator of the event from zero up to the length of the Le Levy excursion, and then dt again is Lebesgue measure, and this is the, the Levy excursion measure. Right. Okay. And so here, um, in this this third construction, um, the marginal on x is just n weighted by the integral from zero to t of one over x s ds. Okay. okay. And so the way that we think of these things is that um, Here you're just waiting by somehow the, the length of the Levy excursion in construction two. And in construction three, 
if you think of this levy excursion as somehow being related to the, the QLE, then here you're somehow weighting by the distance. It's somehow a distance weighted, um, distance weighted construction. Okay. So this, this weighting is like weighting by um, the quantum, the distance between um, two typical points on the sphere. Okay. Okay, and let me give these measures names. So this one, this measure sometimes we just refer to as um, M2 SPH, because this is describing uh, a sphere with two marked points. This measure is a sphere with two marked points where we've weighted it by the amount of time it takes the SLE6 to go from one point to the other one. And then the last one is like, um, it's, it's a measure in a sphere with two marked points where somehow you're weighting it by the distance as measured by the SLE6 to go from one point to the other point. Okay. And um, what do we want to show? I want to show the following. So let's say this is my strip. Okay. Then um, if I produce a sample from M2 SPH D. So this consists of a sphere together with an SLE6. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my SLE6 up until the special time t. Okay, so eta here, this is the SLE6. It's going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And I've drawn it up to the special time t that's associated with um, associated with this measure. Okay. OK, and then I'm going to let um, eta bar be the time reversal. Of eta. And I'm going to let t bar be the first time um, that eta bar hits eta up to time t. OK, so I have this picture where I have drawn um, one of the SLE6s, sorry, the SLE6 up until typical time. And I've done it, then I draw the other, I draw its time reversal, eta bar, up until it first hits, um, it first hits uh, eta. So this right here is eta of t, and this point down here is eta bar of t bar. Okay. And so what do we want to do now? So if I let x be the surface which is um, separated from plus infinity, by eta up to time t. X bar is going to be the surface separated from plus infinity, sorry, from minus infinity by eta bar up to time t bar. And then B is going to be what's left. So it's um, the remaining surface. 
Okay, so in this picture, the stuff cut up by the white curve corresponds to x, the stuff cut off by the purple curve corresponds to x bar, and the stuff which remains is just um, is b. And what we want to do is we want to show that, um, so our goal is to show that the law under this particular measure of x comma x bar comma b, this is equal to the law of x bar comma x comma b. Okay. So we want to show that um, if you look at the surface cut up by the first SLE6 drawn up to the typical time, the second one until it hits it, then you can't tell which one is which. They look exactly the same. And the reason that that uh, suffices to finish the proof The reason that this suffices is that um, you can take this picture so let me let me copy it down here. So I have the same picture I had a moment ago. So here is eta up to time t. Here is eta bar up until it hits it. So this is eta bar of t. If you take this picture with the two meeting SLE6s, and then you reshuffle it, so you perform the Tipri randomization procedure, then what you're going to do, what you're going to end up with are not two meeting SLE6s, you are going to end up with a pair of meeting um, QLEs. So you'll have something like a QLE um, growth um, gamma up to time tau, and you'll end up with, and then eta bar will turn into gamma bar up to time uh, tau bar. Okay. And if this picture is symmetric, then what you get when you perform the reshuffling operation down here is also going to be symmetric. And then this will then prove exactly what we need to show that, um, to show what we needed for uh, the first step. Okay. So really the, the heart of the problem is just to understand this uh, sort of strange symmetry statement for SLE6 on uh, a Liouville quantum gravity sphere. Okay, and um, <coughs> so where does it come from? Um, It's going to come from, again, the reversibility of SLE6. And why is that? Um, well, so for a moment now, let's prove an analogous symmetry, symmetry statement for um, analogous symmetry statement for um, not M2 SPH D, but M2 SPH W. So in this measure, what you have is you have a quantum, quantum sphere, and on top of it you have your SLE6, which is going from um, minus infinity to plus infinity, like this somehow. 
And the measure is, is what you get when you take this picture under the original quantum sphere measure and you weight it by the uh, amount of time it takes the SLE6 to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So what you see here is SLE6 on a quantum sphere uh, weighted by uh, the time to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And in addition to that, you have a time t which is uniform between um, 0 and this, um, this time. Okay, so the structure you have is you have this uh, sphere. On top of it, you have an SLE6. And then you have a time which is chosen uniformly from the amount of time it takes for the SLE to go from here to here. So you have a marked time. Let's say it's this time. Okay. And the point is that this picture here is completely symmetric because SLE6 is reversible and um, the time was just chosen uniformly from the amount of time it takes to go from one side to the other. Okay. So in particular, under this law, Um, what do we know? We know that the um, if I let uh, y be the surface um, separated from um, plus infinity by eta up to time t, I let y bar be the surface um, separated from um, minus infinity by, um, let's say, eta from time t up to time infinity, and b, the remaining surface, or sorry, let me call it q, the remaining surface, then um, by the reversibility of SLE6, this whole picture is symmetric, We have that the M2 SPH uh, W law of y, y bar Q is equal to the M SPH law of um, y bar Y and Q. Okay, so all that this is saying is that in this picture here, um, you, can't, you can't tell in some sense in which direction this was drawn. And this is just because you can't tell in which direction an SLE6 um, was drawn. Okay, and so to finish the, the proof now, um, we want to deduce the corresponding thing for the law um, M2 SBH uh, D. Okay. Now, remember, in the law for M2 SBH uh, D, we ran the SLE6 up until the special time T, and then we ran the uh, time reversal up until um, it first hit uh, hit the SLE, SLE6 in the first direction. Okay. And the difference between the two laws is that in M2 SPH D, we have this extra factor 1 over XT appearing. And somehow we want to make that uh, appear under, um, under the law M2 SPH W that we had over here. Okay, and so how is that going to happen? So the idea is very simple.
So what I can do is I can assume that I'm working under the law M2 SPHW and I draw my SLE6 up to the special time t and then I can condition on the event that this time is actually a cut time. Okay? So if I condition eta of t to be a cut time, then what's going to happen is that um, that's like conditioning the time reversal to first hit eta exactly at its tip. Okay, so then this becomes eta bar, first hitting eta at exactly at its tip. Okay. And um, if you condition on this to be a cut time, you know, there's some work to make this precise because this is a zero probability event, then you're still going to get a picture which is symmetric. So then um, um, y, y bar q will still have the same law as um, Uh, y bar yq, because I took a measure which was symmetric and I conditioned it on uh, a symmetric event. Okay. okay, but the point is that the probability that this event happens is just going to uh, correspond to the inverse of the length of eta at time t. Okay. So this law, it turns out, is exactly equal to the M2 SPH D law of X, X bar, and B. Okay? And, and again, the reason for this is the following. Let me draw the picture again. So let me just explain that in a little bit more detail. Um, so if this is the, um, the strip, then you know, how would you make it precise, the event that you're conditioning on um, something being in a cut time? Well, you imagine you draw the first process up to time t, and then you can condition on the event that the time reversal hits the first process in some interval, like it could hit the interval from here to here of length epsilon. Okay, So if that's an epsilon length interval, then the probability that this guy is going to first hit eta exactly in that interval is going to be of order um, epsilon over xt. If xt is the boundary length and epsilon is the length of this little thing. And so when you condition on uh, a time being a cut time, it exactly is going to introduce the extra factor which allows you to go from n sphw to m sph uh, d. Okay. And so this, um, this symmetry statement uh, falls out. But of course, there's quite a bit of work that goes behind uh, checking that this is actually the case. So one has to be careful with this conditioning argument. Um, but that's um, sort of the main idea behind the proof. And, and this is sort of the heart of the argument that this defines, um, defines the metric. OK. Um, so let me just finish in the last few minutes by uh, explaining a few more things. So at this point, what does one have? So
you have a metric on um, on a countable dense set, so a, a sequence of IID points. on a square root eight-thirds um, Liouville quantum gravity sphere. Okay, and um, what one wants to show to sort of um, finish this program is uh, to show that this metric somehow extends continuously to something which is homeomorphic to the real sphere, and it is the Brownian map. And let me just sort of very briefly explain in the last few minutes um, how one um, checks these things. So to show that the metric uh, continuously extends, there's a particular trick um, that we've used um, many, many times, a number of times in, in these papers, um, which allows one to control the size of uh, QLE. So you have to um, control the size and shape of a QLE growth. And there's a very funny trick that allows you to do this, and it, it's quite powerful because you can also apply this to other things like SLE itself. And that's that um, if you grow, if you're working on a, um, let's say, a quantum sphere, and you grow a QLE up to a given time, then um, the unexplored region here is going to be a quantum disk. And one way of thinking about that is that this just tells you that if you apply the conformal transformation phi, which takes you from this complement to say, um, let's say Euclidean disk, then you know that the field H composed with phi inverse plus Q times the log of phi inverse prime, this is a quantum disk. And let me call this H tilde. And if you somehow want to control, you know, how, how rough the boundary of this QLE is, or how, how big it is, basically one way of controlling it is trying to understand uh, this conformal map here. And so what you can do is you can just solve, you can use this equation and solve for, um, solve for the log of the derivative. So you have this change of coordinates formula. where you know that um, this comes from a quantum sphere, that comes from a quantum disk. They're coupled in some complicated way. But anyway, it's just going to be true that um, phi prime is equal to, well, you can solve for the, the log of phi prime. So q times the log of phi prime is equal to h tilde minus h composed with phi inverse. And because this is related to a Gaussian free field, and that's related to a Gaussian free field, you can use this to bound the behavior of this map and argue that these QLEs are actually not going to be, um, not going to be too large. Okay. So this, um, this constrains um, the behavior of um, phi prime, and that constrains um, the size of the QLE. And arguments of this type are actually good enough that you can show that um, the uh, metric space defined in this way does, in fact, it continuously extend to the case of the sphere. And once one does that, then one can al also show that this uh, metric space is not only going to continuously extend to something which is homomorphic to the sphere, but it's also going to be um, geodesic. It's a geodesic metric space. And essentially, to show that um, the metric space is actually the Brownian map, what one has to do is somehow understand how these uh, geodesics um, interact with each other. But since now, um, well, there isn't uh, very much time left, uh, I won't say anything about that. But if anybody's interested, I'm happy to discuss it, um, discuss it offline. Um, OK, so maybe I'll, I'll stop, stop there.
person, so I guess I'll ask. Any questions? <laughs> so, um, where is the Brahman Yeah. Appearing? The Brahman map. Oh, where does it actually appear? Um, so this metric space is the Brownian map. It's the same metric space as the Brownian map. Uh, it's not obvious that it is the Brownian map um, because the way that the Brownian map is defined is, is somehow um, not obviously appearing in this particular construction. But the way that you, s you can see that this is the Brownian map is you, um, you try to understand how, um, how geodesics in the Brownian, or sorry, in the in Liouville quantum gravity interact with each other. So you imagine you've grown uh, a metric ball which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this, this is your, your filled metric ball. And um, what you can then do is then you can draw the geodesics which go, you get some kind of tree of geodesics going from the boundary of this ball back to minus infinity. And um, what you can do in both the Brownian map setting and also in the Liouville quantum gravity setting is you can understand um, the law of this geodesic tree, not only at a fixed radius, but you can understand um, what happens as you move the boundary of the metric ball back in time and get closer and closer to minus infinity. And um, essentially to show that a metric space is the Brownian map, you just have to check that this geodesic tree has the right um, sort of behavior and it also evolves in the correct way when you move the boundary of the metric ball back to, um, back to minus infinity. And then you also just need to know that, um, that um, somehow this property is invariant under the operation of sampling these, these two points. And once you check that, then it's possible to show that, um, that it is the Brownian map. So those, those two properties essentially single out the Brownian map. Um, on the Liouville quantum gravity side, um, somehow where these properties come from is uh, from the sort of construction itself of QLE. Um, so roughly speaking, you need to understand how these boundary lengths between geodesics evolve. And what you need to know is that they evolve as independent continuous state branching processes as you move the metric ball back in time. And where that comes from <coughs> is in the approximations to QLE, you know, basically what you're doing is you're somehow attaching little pieces of SLE6 if you want to advance the metric ball either forward or backward. And when you attach a little piece of SLE6, let's say to here, what happens is that this interval is going to get a Levy process increment, uh, Levy process increment, and it's going to be independent of, uh, it's got not going to depend on um, the, these particular intervals. And so when you draw these little SLE6s in, the different intervals are getting independent Levy process increments, and somehow you can extract from that that the boundary lengths really are evolving in the, the correct way for it to be the Brownian map. Um, so you don't see the, the Brownian snake appear exactly, but rather you see uh, this sort of geodesic tree structure, which is built into the Brownian snake appearing in Liouville quantum gravity. Yep. 